Welcome to Season 3 of Inflammation Nation. My name is Gronia O'Leary. Inflammation Nation is a podcast from Arthritis Ireland aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of arthritis and related conditions. Hello everyone and I'm delighted to be joined by Mr Andrew McCann today. Andrew has spent the last 20 years working in the area of rights and entitlements, specifically in the area of social welfare, health and housing. He's written over 10 Know Your Rights annuals and has contributed to other books and articles, as well as appearing on Ireland AM, The Afternoon Show with Dahi and Mora, News Talk, 2FM and other national and regional radio stations. And he has also been successful with reviews and appeals to the Department of Social Protection, Social Welfare Appeals and the Ombudsman's Office. So the social welfare and health services systems are complicated and finding the information you need can sometimes be a difficult and emotional journey for those who have not had to look for it before. So Andrew is here to give us guidance on this matter. You're very welcome, Andrew, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. So I'm going to kick off my first question, which is really about, you know, look, getting to grips with the system and understanding how to apply successfully for benefits and entitlements appears to be, you know, a really important factor in the successful outcome of applications. How would you recommend that people go about engaging with the system? It is a vast system. I've been working in it for over 20 years. And if you think of the social welfare system, you know, it's been in place since, well, it's been amended since the 1970s. So year on year tweaks, changes, amendments. So it's very complicated and very complex. And I suppose the, the difficult thing, like any complicated situation, you know, when people are in a difficult situation, they panic, they don't know where to turn to, everything, where do I go, where do I start? And it's a bit like, how do you eat an elephant in small pieces? Mm. So you have to figure out what is most important to you, where do I start? So where you figure out where you want to start is, what is your scenario? What is best for you? What are you looking for? Are you looking for a payment for you? Are you looking for a payment for your children? Are you looking for a primary payment as a weekly payment? Are you looking for support for health for your family? Are you looking for adaptations to your house? Are you looking to return to work? Are you away from work? So it's trying to figure out, okay, what is my situation? What am I looking for? Where do I need to turn to? And I suppose in figuring out all that, that's the first step. After that, I suppose, is then talking to an expert. Uh, an expert that you can rely upon. So, uh, and an expert source of information. So, for example, sinsinformation.ie is updated daily. Uh, government websites, gov.ie, revenue.ie, good, reliable sources of information that's updated regularly and will put you in the right direction to start with. I think secondly, Gráinne, it's about maybe going and speaking to somebody. I think it's always best sitting down in front of somebody talking to somebody, explaining your situation. I know since COVID now, in Sins Information, you can go and sit and speak to somebody and talk to somebody. That might be helpful. Some people prefer talking by phone. Some people prefer an email or a chat. Um, But it's trying to have that conversation, telling your story and trying to get some direction and shape as to where to go. But sometimes people just don't know where to start. And that's the hardest challenge. Yeah, And is it useful in that regard to you know, have any, I suppose, really think through about how you would articulate your situation or provide information about your situation in advance of, say, a meeting like that. Yeah, I I think I always think, Granny, the hardest part is going, you know, where do I start? And it's like that big relief, getting the weight off your shoulder Mm. and just getting your story out. There are tons and tons and tons of supports out there for people in all different scenarios. But it's trying to figure out what's useful for me What do I need? But I think it's just sitting down and explaining because people think, sure, it's just my situation. Everybody has the same situation. We're all in the same boat. No, there are supports that are out there for people suit their situation. We have to figure out what's best for you, what your neighbour gets or what another person gets is not the same for you. There's a lot of common misconceptions. People think they're not entitled to things mm-hmm. when they are entitled to things. And we'll obviously explore that through, through the programme today. But it's just about taking the first journey of talking to somebody, saying, this is my situation. Is there any help available to me? Don't be afraid to ask. The supports are there. But it's just having that conversation, be it with a friend, 
family, an organization, someone you can talk to and to put you, start you on that right track and to figure out where you can go, what's a priority for you now, what's a priority for your family, what's a priority for your situation and working through that step by step. It's a bit like building a house. Mm. You have to figure out the foundation first. Where am I going? What do I need to do? What's the plan? And then from there, you can work along that journey. Okay, that's really, I think that's really sound advice for people listening. And I think one of the things we were discussing, Andrew, was that we weren't going to sort of start at benefit number one and work our way through all of the benefits. We're we're going to look really more at the framework and the approach and the process that people might engage with Mm -hmm. um, around these things. So obviously there are a myriad of benefits and entitlement, as you've just said. But I'm going to ask you, about some of the most common queries that we receive in Arthritis Ireland. Um, so, you know, let's start with medical cards. Yes. Start with an easy one. Yes, OK. <laughs> you know, in your experience, who might be eligible and how can a person best go about their application to have the best chance of success? OK, so let's get the myths out of the way first. So there's a common misconception to say uh, only people on social welfare can get a medical card. That's totally untrue. Right. Yeah. To get that out of the yeah. way. There's over about 40, the last time I looked at it, about over 40% of the population have a medical card. It's a very large proportion of people mm-hmm. are eligible to a medical card. And the best scenario I can explain to your listener is each scenario is looked at separately. The good thing about the medical card system, it looks at a, what a, let's call it a weighing scale. So, you know, the, the traditional weighing scales, you have a mm. balance on one side and the other yeah. and you're looking at, at the balancing and one outweighs the other. Right. So on my left hand or on your left scale, you have, what is my situation? So my situation, am I single? Am I married? Do I have children? What are the ages of the children? What is my situation? So depending on your family status, your single status, the number of children you have, what age the children have, there are a number of different allowances granted to you, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, if you're renting or paying a mortgage. Now, the good thing about the medical card scheme, it takes into account fully the rent and mortgage you pay. So if you're paying somewhere like a grand, 1500 a month in rent, that's fully taken into account in your scenario because that's an outgoing that you pay, yeah. right? So other things that are taken into account, your house insurance, your mortgage protection, your childcare costs, your travel costs to and from work. So they're all on that left hand of the balance, right? Yeah. So and then on the other side of the balance of the scale is what is your income? So from an income point of view, your income after deductions, so net of tax, right? So you're looking at the weighing scales and balancing it up, right? So from a sense that if you have, let's say, a family who have a very high rent and mortgage, who have a number of children, I have come across scenarios, just take off the top of my head, couples maybe 800, 1,000 a week who can be eligible to a medical card because they have a lot of high costs like high rent, high mortgage, childcare costs, a lot of travel to and from work, they travel every day and their family situation. So what I would say to you and to the listener is don't assume you're not eligible to a medical card. You make an application. You can do it online to start with mymedicalcard.ie. You can use the traditional paper-based approach. That's no problem. You make an application. It doesn't cost you a penny to make an application and you will be assessed on your application for a medical card and GP card at the same time. Okay. So you don't need separate applications. All will be assessed in the one application. Okay. And and the one thing, Grani, is that since since November 2023, the thresholds have increased. So more and more people are becoming more eligible to a medical card and more and more people are becoming eligible to a GP card. And without going into the specifics of all the figures and stuff, you know, in general, you know, people who have high costs will be eligible to a medical card. And if not, will be eligible to a GP card, which will cover you for GP visits. And we know the cost of GP visits. 50 to 60 euro a visit. Could be you, your family, your children. It's a lot of money. Yeah. 
Can I just clarify something with you yes. there when you mention about costs? Because um, obviously the people we get queries from are people living with arthritis, mm-hmm. um, and many of them may have high medical costs. Yes. Um, if they, if, you know, if they don't qualify for a medical, if if they have not applied for a yes. medical card yet, um, they may well have high medical costs in terms of their medications, GP visits, physiotherapy visits, maybe occupational therapy. Some of which they will, you know, people will sometimes choose to. Um, acquire privately because yes. they need it and they will get it quicker. Also things in relation to, you know, health insurance and etc. Can that all be okay. included on the cost side? Yeah, so I suppose what, what can be included on the cost side is, as we said, the family status or the person status, the children that they have, the ages of the children, um, the mortgage, the rent, the house insurance, the mortgage protection, childcare costs, travelling costs. What's not taken into account is private health costs or private health. So I suppose looking at that bigger picture, so I suppose first thing we want to get people into the medical card system. So we either want to, I suppose the benefits of a medical card, very simply, we're talking about the free GP visits anyway, which mm-hmm. is part of a GP. You're talking about the reduced medication costs of as little as one euro fifty per item or 15 euro maximum uh, for 10 items or more. That's a big difference than your traditional 80 euro a month on your med on your your maximum medication costs okay mm-hmm. um your a and e costs if applicable right since 2023 in hospital uh, public fees have been abolished yes. so there is no more fees for that regardless okay so if you think of the sample uh, the, the example you gave of people maybe doing private uh, physio or other things some of those costs can be claimed back to the Med One or tax relief system yes. at twenty percent, and those costs add up very quickly. Um, some of the private health providers provide a rebate from the provider themselves also on a number of visits. So it's important to be aware of what policy you have, what the benefits are, what you can claim back separate from the tax system. Yeah. And so, to do it. Yes. Absolutely. To make time in your, yes. at the end of the year to do it. Yes. Uh, and I suppose what's what what's very important now, even from a private health point of view, you can claim as you go. So as you spend, you can submit payments and get refunds as you go. On the tax system, you can upload expenditure as you go to the year rather than waiting till the end of the year. So it can be done either at the end of a year or to the year. And then the other things you can claim back, don't forget, is, is tax relief on your prescription costs uh, at 20% as well, which is important, and any other um, services provided by private uh, practitioners, 20%, or things that are prescribed by a medical practitioner uh, because of your medical condition, things that may be recommended or prescribed by them. Yeah. So there's a number of things, but I suppose, you know, when we come back to the medical card, the benefits of the medical card is the reduced prescription costs, the free GP visits, which is very important, the A&E fees if applicable, access to aids and appliances that you wouldn't have to pay for privately, um, and access to all that service, which can save you in your pocket as well as the tax relief that's also available to you through the tax system. That should make a big difference to a family. I mean, if you're not successful in getting a medical card, um, I think what you've clarified yeah. there is that your application may be taken into account for a GP yeah, card as well. Yeah, I suppose well. just to be clear, Gwendy, the, the thresholds, so I suppose we, we without going into specific, the thresholds for, for a GP card are higher than a medical card. Okay. So if you don't get over the hurdle for a medical card, you certainly can be over the hurdle for a GP card, but because the thresholds are about 20% higher than the okay. thresholds for a medical card. So that brings a lot of people into the scenario um, that may have missed the hurdle for the medical card, but who would be eligible to a GP card for them and the family members. OK, that's that's really important information. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so the other thing we, we often get asked about is the long term illness scheme. And I suppose a okay, key question for us in Arthritis yes. Ireland is, yes. you know, why is arthritis not recognised yes. as part of this scheme? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about the scheme? Because yeah. it is something that pops up yes. 
It is. Um, and, and sometimes I think the perception is that arthritis is not recognised as a long term health condition. And you often hear, we often hear that phrase being used. Now, obviously, it is a long term health condition, yeah. but I think very often because it's not recognised on the scheme, people perceive that it's not being taken seriously. And so, can you tell us a little bit more sure. about I suppose, the origins yeah, of the scheme? Uh, and the, the scheme in itself, the long term in the scheme, actually goes back to the 1970s, yeah. right? It's the, Men the Mental Health Act or the Health, health Act of 1970. Um, and there have been many changes and amendments to that act over the years. We've seen it recently with the change in the hospital fees and so on and so on. But, you know, I've been in this job 20 years, over 20 years, Garnier, and the list of conditions on that long-term illness scheme has not changed, yeah. right? And even, unfortunately to say, some of the wording of some of the conditions has not changed. We think of things, mental illness, we don't even use that terminology mm, yeah. anymore and it's still on that listings. I mean, the biggest probably one that people would recognise more is diabetes. Mm. Um, and a lot of people are not aware of the fact that the long-term illness scheme exists, number one. It means that any medication related to that condition are totally free and any aids and appliance related to that condition are totally free. I suppose other ones we're probably more aware of are epilepsy, cystic fibrosis, spina bifida, Parkinson's. Um, but I do believe, Grania, it, it is time that that list is reviewed because, as you rightly said, a lot of your listeners are living with arthritis, not just maybe them, their family, their children. And that list, in my opinion, has not been revised. And I think maybe from today, we need to kick off uh, a request. I suppose there's a lot of uh, elections happening in the mm. next year or two. Maybe it's people you want to speak to and come to your door and ask a question. But I think it's time for reform of that list or review of that list because it, in my opinion it hasn't changed it needs to change um, and to support people who need it most and of course there's apart from arthritis not being on that list there's many 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 Absolutely. other long term Absolutely. health conditions yeah. do you think there's political appetite to even I think there that? should if, if you think of uh, what has been, you know, there have, we have the health service, in my opinion, has made a lot of changes in the last number of years. We have seen the removal of the hospital fees. It used to be 80 euro mm. a night, mm. right? Add a lot of costs. We've seen free contraception from an, and that those have extended. We have seen schemes improved in relation to the medical card, granting medical cards to carers, to children who are getting, parents who are getting domiciliary care for their children. We have seen improvements in the medical cards for emergency services, people with cancer and, and uh, urgent conditions. We have seen improvements in the GP card for children. Um, we've seen a lot of improvements in the health service and the services that have become available and have reduced costs to people. But we haven't seen reform in the long-term illness no. scheme lists. And to me, that should be the next step and it should be the next thing that needs review. Everything else has been reviewed. More money has been spelt on, on the health service um, over the years and we have improved expenditure compared to other European countries in the health sector. Compared to other countries, more money has been spent in that sector. But this is the one area, in my opinion, that hasn't been reformed mm. that needs reform. Okay. Um, so moving on, I'd like to ask you just about certain benefits that can then, I suppose, enable people to have access to secondary benefits on, mm. on the foot of that. For example, the medical card. We know that the medical card can perhaps open doors to other secondary benefits. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I suppose... Um the medical card in itself is a little bit of a standalone because I suppose in in that sense it gives you access to the reduced prescription costs and the aids and appliances and A and E fees. So that's a little bit of a standalone scheme. But I suppose what what you're primarily linking it to is the social welfare system, and the social welfare system is such a vast system. So I suppose just to explain to listeners some of the basic principles of the social welfare system. Mm. So people will hear things like payments that maybe are allowance or non-contributory based. And when you hear those words, Grania, they're payments related to what we call a means test, right? A means test as in looking at income and savings, all the figures, right? When you hear of payments that relate to benefit or contributory those payments are based on your PRSI or your work history. So just to make that distinction, yeah, yeah. okay? So generally, you have to come into a payment, 
uh, be it a benefit based or a non contributory based or allowance based. And once you're in the payment and in the system, then that will open the door to you to other secondary benefits, like what we call the household benefits, the electricity, the TV license, uh, travel. Um, for carers, you're talking about the, the, the care support grant, a grant that's paid on a yearly basis. Um, you're talking about access to the medical card in the sense that if you're caring for somebody or your child has, has a, uh, you're getting a payment for domiciliary care for a child. So I suppose the primary one where you have secondary benefits is mainly in the welfare system. So you have to get into the welfare system to therefore get access to the secondary benefits. So the most important thing really is getting into the payment. Right. And I suppose, you know, people will will ask a lot of questions about, you know, you know, sickness and short term payments and long term payments and not to get too specific about it. In, in, in the welfare system, we have what we call short term payments and long term payments. So a short term payment would be, you know, if you're sick from work in a short term and what they define short term as being a maximum of two years. Right. It can start as being a couple of weeks, mm. you know, you know, when you're out sick from work for a week or two and that may last up to two years. But at that point, under the illness benefit scheme, that is the maximum period that you can get paid under that scheme regardless. It has to stop. It has to cut at two years. Right. And then you're into the long term scheme of sickness payments. And when they mean long term schemes, they mean a condition that has lasted for 12 months and will last at least for another 12 months. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. And as I've explained, we have disability allowance, which is means tested. And we have what we call an invalidity pension, which is an awful word in my, in yes, my day. Yes, yes, it's it an is awful, awful word, but that's the word. Still unfortunately, the word. that's still the word hasn't changed. <laughs> so, invalidity pension is a long-term illness payment. Also, that a condition has lasted for twelve months and will continue for twelve months. Horrible word, but that's the scheme. And what as exactly it is. is the difference between the disability okay. allowance and okay. an invalidity pension? Okay, so we have disability allowance, and we use the word allowance, and we said that word allowance is about a means-tested payment. Okay, so that's about money coming into the house. It's about savings. And again, people always get frightened when you come to savings. Yes, they always yeah. go, oh, do I have to tell them? Do I really have to tell them what's going on? The good thing, and again, getting over the myths and the misunderstandings, mm. on disability allowance, a person who applies for disability allowance can have savings of up to €50,000 without affecting their weekly payment. Mm. It's a very high threshold. Mm. And even their situations, maybe if somebody got an award or something happened, even if they have savings above that, that does not rule them out of a payment. It just means as your savings go above 50,000, the more you go up to scale, the proportion of payment will be reduced from your weekly amount. Okay. Not to get too technical. So mm, that's, don't be, mm. people shouldn't be frightened off one by savings and then what you have. You have to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. So from a disability allowance point of view, it looks at your, your means, your income, your savings. Mm -hmm. From an invalidity pension point of view, that's related to your work history, okay. what we call your PRSI contributions. So the benefit of that is that you can you can get that payment on your work history, regardless of the income coming into the house, regardless of the income, regardless of savings. Nice. They're questions that are not taken into account for you, the applicant. Right. So just to make that distinction, because mm, mm. people always get them confused. Yes, yes. They get the terminology confused. And what I would I would always suggest, Grania, is to try and focus on payments for people for either invalidity or illness, which are based on their work history, because it doesn't pull in all the information about means and savings mm -hmm. and income and all those questions that you don't necessarily want to answer or have to answer. And that would always be my first part of call. And if things don't fit into that equation, then we would look at the other option. So it's looking at what's best for them, their scenario. Sometimes it's better looking at, at the disability one because they don't have a lot of income or savings. So it's figuring out what's best for them. So there's no standard fit for every person scenario. You look at it case by case.
just as you were talking there about, you know, illness benefit and um, invalidity pension, I suppose working part time, yes. you know, is a frequent consideration for yes. many people who live with arthritis, you mm. know, to help them manage their condition mm. or indeed when they return to work, maybe from a period where they've been off. Absolutely. Off. For someone who's been out of work, mm. you know, for a period of time, maybe they've been on Ill- illness benefit, um, but they're looking to re-enter the workforce. There's always this sort of perceived conundrum about how they start that yes. um, reintegration back into work and what that will mean in terms of, you know, managing maybe the, the loss of benefit or, you know, in yes. terms of depending on what kind of entitlement or benefit they're receiving, how many hours they can work, etc. Yes. Yeah. Now, I know we said we don't want to get into specifics yeah. because they can, do change. At a high level, yeah. um, but I, can you just talk me sure. through that? So, look, I understand fully, Grani. Sometimes the biggest concern is I want to work I want to do something that's maybe rehabilitative. I want to get back to maybe what they seem as normality or meeting or having a structure or doing something, right? But they're concerned about what are the implications for me and my family and my income, okay? So at a very high level, just to be to be clear, there are schemes and supports available for people returning to work, okay? So the difficulty we have sometimes growing in the welfare system is that you are either fit for work or you're not yes. fit for work. Okay. Yes, there's no and halfway some, house. And sometimes a half. Yeah. But there, luckily in the last number of years, there is a halfway house. Mm. And the halfway house is what we call partial capacity, right? And partial capacity relates specifically, Grania, to illness benefit and invalidity. So I'll just take those two together to start with. Mm-hmm. So what the scheme says is that if you've been six months on illness benefit, you can explore the option of returning to work, right? And as I said, in in years gone by, there used to be you have to get exemptions and limits and errors and all this sort of yes, stuff. That's yes. gone, right? So if you're on illness or invalidity for more than six months, you can consider what we call partial capacity. What does that mean? It means that you can work, right? No restriction on errors, no restriction on pay on these schemes, right? But you have to be assessed as to what is your current condition because the scheme will allow you keep some of your money from the social welfare payment and work as well, right? Mm -hmm. So what you earn from work is not impacted on your social welfare payment. It's only impacted from a tax perspective if it's relevant. Okay. So the scheme will say on partial capacity, there are, there are three different tiers, uh, um, moderate and, and profound, just three scales. At the bottom of the scale, it'll say at minimum you can keep half of your social welfare and you can work. In extreme cases, they will say you can keep all your social welfare and work. But you have to be assessed as in uh, 50%, 75% or 100%. Mm-hmm. And that's that's on the scenario that will have to be assessed by the department before you start work. Okay. So you cannot start work until you make the application, until you talk to your GP, if you're fit to mm-hmm. do work and what sort of work you can do, and that you've made an application or had a conversation with the partial capacity benefit section and they've given you permission to proceed and they will make an assessment of your situation, which of course you can appeal. We'll talk about that in a while. Um, and that will allow you to go and work unrestricted on errors, unrestricted on pay and to keep some of your payment because people are always worried about if I come off my payment what if I can't get back on it again what if there's a problem um, what's the situation so the for what I'm saying is in summary for illness benefit and invalidity pension after six months on those payments you can consider partial capacity and stepping yourself back into work on a phase basis okay on the disability allowance scheme we've said it's means tested mm-hmm. So therefore, there is a link to earnings, okay? There isn't a link to hours of work, but there is a link to earnings. And under that scheme, you can have an exemption from a certain amount of money. Uh, It's about €180 a week, uh, as far as I can recall, which means that you can earn that amount of money without affecting your weekly disability allowance payment, okay? When you go above that amount... They will consider half of the excess to a certain amount. And then if you really earn a lot or maybe over about 475 a week, all that above that will Mm -hmm. be taken into account. But it does allow you 
on the disability allowance side to work, work part time, to earn money without affecting your weekly payment and depending on your earnings, only some of it or none of it may be taken into account. So that should give people a little bit of an understanding as there are options to return to work. There are options to keep a payment and return to work. And then there's the third and final option, which we we, we haven't mentioned, is that maybe people might go, well, maybe I want to come off those payments completely. And they might decide, okay, I'm fit to return to work and maybe I don't want to be on a sickness payment. Mm -hmm. And there are two other schemes that may be applicable to those. There's a thing called a back to work family dividend. So there may be an option in some scenarios where you can keep a payment in returning to work after you've been on a social welfare payment. Okay, so it's kind of a transition back. Right. Or there's a thing called working family payments. So it's a payment for families who have dependent children, depending on their income. So that's a scheme that looks at what you're earning what what a family of a relevant size should earn and looking at a little top up weekly payment that would be locked in for 12 months. So, you know, if you fall out of the sickness scheme for whatever reason, mm-hmm. either your choice or if your doctor certifies you fit for work or if you're reviewed by the department as being fit for work or or any other reviews, you may come off the payment, but there are supports transitioning you back. And we mentioned earlier on the medical card. You can also retain your medical card if you've been on it for a period of time and return to work. So it's a little blanket protection about returning to work. But I suppose you need to look at that in a case by case scenario, person by person, what's best for you. OK, thank you. And my next question really is about, you know, if it's possible to appeal the outcome yes. of an application. Yeah, and and we, we know you can appeal, you can appeal uh, if you're yes. not successful the first yeah. time. And how might a person go about that appeal okay. in order to have, I suppose, their best chance of yeah. ha- making a successful appeal? When we talk about appeals, I always talk about what's best before we get to that stage, right? So we've talked about schemes, we've mm. talked about disability allowance, we've talked about invalidity pension. Those schemes can take quite a while to process, okay? And my tip for listeners is actually doing all the work in advance of the application. Okay. So sometimes the form doesn't prompt you for all the things. Okay. And sometimes people think, sure, I'll just fill in the form here, send it off, should be fine. Right. From my experience, and it has been reported in annual reports, over half of applications are turned down on a first application. Okay. Because maybe there's insufficient detail. So what I suggest to people is you have to sometimes get inside the mind of the people processing the application form. Okay, they're not medical experts. There are generally clerical people who process the forms. Right. And you have to make it as simple and easy as possible for them to approve your application at the first hurdle. Right. So if you do all that prep work at the start. So what does that mean? It means that what you need is up to date medical report from your consultant or your GP. You needed to explain what the condition is. You needed to explain how it affects your life and your capacity to work or your ability to work. Right. What I also suggest to a lot of people and which is quite successful is putting together a daily diary on you. So how is this condition affecting me day by day? Mm -hmm. Getting up in the morning, washing, cooking, social life. Am I excluded? Do I want to speak to people? I don't want to speak to people. Do I look after myself? Do I have medication to take? Am I safe to take it myself? Does somebody need to help me do it? Does somebody need to help me wash, bathe, travel? You're getting, you're painting a picture of somebody's life in a daily diary, right? And by, it's not a requirement in the application to include a daily diary, Mm. but from my experience, it has been quite successful in helping people be successful at the first hurdle. Mm. So it's about doing your homework first, not rushing the form and providing as much information as possible and supporting information to help with your application. You can never have enough information. Okay. Okay? So if in the example I've explained where people have been unsuccessful in their application, 
they get a letter back in the post to say, Dear Grania, unfortunately, we've looked at your situation and we feel that you, you don't fit in the criteria. Now, for them, from my experience, it, it feels as though that's an attack on me. They don't know me. They don't understand me. They don't live my life. They don't live with my condition, right? And some people will go, ah, look, it doesn't matter. And they just ignore it mm. and don't appeal it, right? What I would suggest to people is to talk to an expert again, contact yourselves or contact the citizens information, your local citizens information office, uh, because help can be available in appealing the decision. And what's very important, Grania, is at present there's only a 21 day uh, period of appeal, which means that you must appeal within that period of time or your appeal will be late and cancelled. Okay. Okay. That's so that's the appeal process. Is that new? That's no, that has always been, that's there, always been there. But it's been very okay. they're very sticky now okay. about the time frame. Mm. Okay. And to be clear to listeners, what happens is that appeal goes to an independent body called the Social Welfare Appeals uh, Service. Okay. They are not directly linked to social welfare. They are purely independent from social welfare. So they it's not the same people looking at the same stuff. Okay. So they will request a copy of your file from the relevant department, see what's in the file, examine the information. They will also expect you or your advocate, whoever's going to help you or work with you, to prepare documentation. So why am I appealing this decision? Why do I feel the department is wrong? And don't forget, you or I, Gronya, or any of our listeners can request a copy of your file free of charge from the department under the Freedom of Information legislation and they must provide you with a free copy of your file within 30 days. So everything that the department have on you mm -hmm. in your application, how they made that decision, what notes were taken, who examined the file, why they declined it, you have a right to see it. And from my experience in working on cases, it's important to get that file because you, it's like seeing what the other side have, right? Yeah. And seeing what's missing. Right. And if you can see what's missing, then you can prepare a document or what we call a submission and advise the department to say, I am of the belief I wish to appeal this decision because uh, this has changed. This has changed. Or now I have up to date information or uh, I want to speak to an appeals officer. So, Grania, as part of an appeal, you can request to sit in front of somebody and tell your story. Mm -hmm. And by sitting in front of somebody it may be better, you feel better, I wanted to tell my story, I want to tell them what my condition is, I want to tell them how it's affecting me and I want them to know how it is. And they can be quite successful because you're actually sitting in yes. front of somebody. Yeah. It's not a courtroom, mm. it's simply a, a room, a desk, a table, a person who will listen to your mm. story, right? That's called an oral hearing. So you can ask for an oral hearing or sometimes they will simply, you will be successful if you submit all the up-to-date information, uh, your daily diary, people might have forgot that in the first application. Mm -hmm. They may put in a detailed consultant report or an up-to-date report if the condition has changed or worse. So, but the problem with the appeal, Grony, is that you get your decision today, you have 21 days to appeal it, and it can take up to six months or so before your appeal is considered approved or denied okay and that's time yeah right yeah. and that's added to the time it took in the first place to make a decision sure. so what's important for listeners is to be prepared at the early stage just take your time fill out the form fill in the detail do your homework get it all prepared it's worth that effort mm. at the early yeah. stage don't rush it don't rush mm. it right mm. and try and get inside the mind of the person reading it. Have I made it easy for them to understand my condition? Have I made it easy for them to know how it affects me on a day-to-day -day basis? Have I made it easy for them to understand the implications, the medication mm. that I'm taking, the side effects of the medication, yeah, yeah. how it's affecting me? By doing all that in the preparation stage, it will help in the long term. So that's, that's the tip. The final thing I'd say, Kranya, is that if by any chance you're late with your appeal, right, which can mm -hmm. happen, post, things are away, happen, right? The other option is what we call a review, right? So a review means going, it, it's a letter going back to the department, 
to say, I want you to review this situation because I feel you made a mistake or an error. OK, uh, maybe you don't have this. Maybe you don't have that. Right. And that's not as time sensitive as the appeal. Right. And when they make a decision on the review, if you're still unsuccessful, the clock starts for the appeal again. OK, so the clock will start mm, for the 21 mm. days again. Okay. Right. Yeah. And again, not getting too complicated again. If you're unhappy with the appeal, there is a further avenue. I was you going can take. to ask. Yes. I was going to ask. Yes. <laughs> so you can you can appeal the appeal. Yes. Right. And that's where it can go to the head of the Ombudsman's office and they can examine. But the only reasons you can ask for an appeal of appeal is generally if all your facts were not fully taken into account or fully considered or there was an error in the law or the part of the law that you asked for it to be assessed. I have had many cases appealed to the appeal and be successful. Mm -hmm. And I have some appeal to the appeal that have been unsuccessful. Yeah, yeah. But it's another avenue. And again, the problem is it's another delay. Yes. Because that delays the process further. So if we bring it right back to the start, it's doing your homework, taking your time, being prepared and being ready at the start. Yeah. Makes a hell of a difference. Yeah, no, that's really sound advice. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to move on now to just discussing a few other um, kind of items that we would get queries about. So this kind of moves in another direction, really. And it's uh, it's about the disabled person's parking card. Mm -hmm. This is, again, very relevant for, for many people living with arthritis. Can you outline to me how this works? Again, it's a little bit of a, I would say, chunky system, right? Mm. Uh, it is what it is, unfortunately. Um, the Sometimes the problem is it's kind of like a two barrier approach. So the first barrier is sometimes getting the application form. It's not just a simple form you can print. Uh, sometimes you have to be pre-assessed for an application. So I know that it, it, the scheme is run by the Disabled Drivers Association of Ireland and the Irish Wheelchair Association. And I know on some of their sites, they have some sort of, they have some pre-entry questions yes, that can help yes. prompt you to get a form. Right. Mm -hmm. So the first part is getting your hands on the form. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I know there's a fee of 35 euro, which is not that lot, not a lot of money. But the, the, the difficulty sometimes is, is getting approval for it. Right. From my experience, um, the, the, the biggest help, if, if you want to say the right word, is people who have a primary medical certificate and a primary medical certificate is granted upon assessment by your local um, health service where there's, a, where there's somebody who will assess your condition. Now again, without getting into the rules and regulations and the technicalities of a primary medical cert, it's quite odd <laughs> would be a word. Um, you have to tick certain boxes, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to fit into that criteria to get the primary medical certificate. If you get the primary medical certificate, then you will automatically be able to get the disabled driver's parking uh, card, right? So I suppose what I'm saying to people is that um, what you need to consider is, depending on your con condition, my focus and my suggestion would be getting in contact with your local health centre and to look to be referred to the to someone who will assess you for a primary medical certificate. And upon their assessment, that will assist with your application for the dis disabled parking uh, ticket card. Um, or it may be a hurdle as to not be eligible for it. But I know there have been a lot of difficulties for listeners uh, in getting the card, firstly getting the application and then getting the card but uh, it is available but it's just the fact that there are technicalities and requirements and rules and regulations of being eligible to get one. Okay. The other things I wanted to ask you about were was in relation to really the home support services mm. and and also the housing adaptation yes. um, grant scheme as well. Yeah. So can you tell us so a little bit about again, how, how that works? Uh, for, for, for your listeners, you know, this scheme is run by the local authorities. So, uh, again, from, from my experience, sometimes what can happen, it may have changed, but sometimes what can happen is that the, the local authority will allocate a certain amount of funding to these schemes at the start of the calendar year. And sometimes, from my experience, that funding will be empty or dried up as the year goes on, right? Which is unfortunate, but it has improved. So, again, 
We talk about uh, on this podcast about means tested schemes. So again, this is a means tested scheme where you're looking to get adaptation to your property, be it adapting a bathroom, stair rails, um, all sorts of things to help with your condition or disability. Right. So we have to get over the hurdle of the means test. And again, some of the misconceptions. So the starting point is is uh, at present thirty thousand euro a year uh, gross. So from that point of view, what they're saying is that if you earn less than thirty thousand a year gross, you can get access up to ninety five percent of the cost of the adaptation, or up to a maximum expenditure of thirty thousand. It just coincides that they're about thirty thousand. Mm, mm. But what we're also saying is that people shouldn't be put off by that. Number two you can have earnings of up to 60,000 a year and still get a partial rebate yes. on the cost. Yeah. So again, yeah. people think they just hear the first yeah, part. Yeah, it's really useful information uh, yes. to have. So it yeah. works on, yeah. a st- on a tapered basis. So uh-huh. the 30,000 is the entry point mm. of which you can get up to 95% of the cost back, but then it goes up to 60,000 mm. of which you can get a proportion of the money back. Mm-hmm. Okay, so people shouldn't be put off by that. Again, we can't go into the technicalities of every scheme, but this scheme does take into account if you have younger children, there are other allowances that can be added to that pot of eligibility, depending on the ages of the children and depending on other factors. And we won't go into the minutiae of each relevant exemption, but what we're saying to people is there is a scheme available. It is available to adapt your home. You shouldn't rule yourself out of eligibility. It is an application form. It's not going to cost you anything to apply. And you have to get pre-approval from the local authority before you can do the work. Yeah. Many people have come across and yes. done the work and now try to do it retrospectively. Mm. Can't be done. So the one thing for listeners is do not start any work until you get approval. And obviously the other things you have to be compliant with, with local property tax and tax clearance and the usual stuff. Yeah. So there are rules and regu- regulations. There are exemptions. There are other eligibility. I would always say to people, always say to people it doesn't cost you it will cost you the price of a stamp mm. and your time that's mm-hmm. the only thing um, and you will need to prepare in advance you will need to get some quotations you will need to prepare your work like we're saying with social welfare payments it's all about the preparation it's all about preparing yourself getting the work done and getting it in for assessment but please never be frightened off by I sure I wouldn't be eligible without doing your homework finding it out or even in the worst case scenario, making an application. What's the worst that can happen? Mm-hmm. You're not eligible. At least you've tried. Yeah. But never be afraid to do it. Yeah. I know. Thank you for that. Because I think that's a, that's a really relevant one for, mm. for many people living with arthritis. Yes. Who find themselves maybe in need of, you know, adapting a bathroom yes. or in fact installing a stair lift, for example. Yeah. Then a pivot now to, to kind of another area and that really it relates to sort of surgery, um, you know, and accessing surgery abroad, yeah. you know, you know, it might be something that somebody may want to consider um, either because of waiting lists here in Ireland yes. um, or because maybe the expertise in that field um, is not available here yeah. in Ireland. So there's, as we know, two schemes available, the cross-border directive and the treatment abroad scheme. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah, how those two schemes... People generally get them mixed up. Yes. Right? They, and yes, again, yes. we've had another hurdle in this mm. now with with uh, Brexit. Yes. Okay. Because yes. um, traditionally, yeah, okay, so let me explain. So the cross-border health care directive is a scheme where you can get treatment uh, or uh, yes, surgery in another EU jurisdiction if you're on a waiting list for a long time in Ireland. Uh, and I know there used to be a, you know, people used to go to Northern Ireland to get treatment done. Mm-hmm. And on my own case, my, my daughter got her teeth done mm-hmm. under the cross-border scheme. Mm. But the that scheme has changed with Brexit. Mm-hmm. There is still a small scheme in place under the Northern Ireland Agreement. Yes. So it's not ruled out completely. Um, but that has been a problem since Brexit. But it is, I suppose, there there are services available across Europe Mm-hmm. Uh, with again a few little minor exemptions that, on certain is countries. Is that under the cross border? No, the, the cross border directive is Northern Ireland. The correct? the cross there is a, there is the the cross border one is not specifically available under Northern Ireland under the Brexit program, mm-hmm. but there is an alternative scheme called the Northern Ireland scheme, okay. which is in place 
that will allow that to happen, but not under specifically the cross-border directive okay. name. Right. So it's just with Brexit has changed things slightly. I'm not saying it's impossible now, just the scheme has changed because of the Brexit situation. Mm-hmm. But we're also talking about the fact that treatment can be done in other EU jurisdictions. Sure. And I suppose what's very important is it does not cover the, the cost of travel uh, under the scheme. Mm. Uh, I would always suggest uh, getting a pro forma or requested cost of the treatment mm-hmm. and getting it approved by the HSE. Uh, the cross-border healthcare, healthcare team are based in Kilkenny. Um, so you would need sort of pre-approval with them first, checking what the treatment is, what the code of the treatment is mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. But it does not cover the cost of travel, right? Um, the treatment abroad scheme is a little bit different in the sense that it is generally for schemes there where the surgery or, or the need is not available in Ireland. Right. So uh, where that treatment is available under a public scheme in another European uh, jurisdiction. Right. So and again, there's specific criteria around that. The consultant is the only one who can refer that under what we call the E112 form. And they have to complete that form and send it to the HSE and look for pre-approval. But it, that service must be available in a public service okay. in another uh, EU, EU uh, jurisdiction okay. of where that service is not available in Ireland. Okay. Right. That's the difference. Mm. The difference is that the the treatment abroad is it's not available here but you can get it abroad. The yeah. cross border is you're waiting a long time yeah. and you want to get it done in a different jurisdiction. That's probably the simplest yes, yes. Uh, Thank you for difference clarifying. between them. Yes. Sure. So we, we've talked a lot about different applications I suppose for different benefits and entitlements and a, and a question I have for you really is um do those applications have to be made online mm. or, you know, in, in obviously we're in the days we're in, yes. um, I would assume that many of them do can be made online. But for people listening for whom who may not be comfortable doing that online, can can they still submit those applications yeah, it's via a great paper? Question, Grania. Digitization has really tried to push everybody and all applications online. Yeah. And I think, in my opinion, digitization is the similar to the literacy barrier we've had before. Yes. Right, because it is a barrier to access, right? And I think it has been accepted by the Department of Education who are rolling out training programs to support people in accessing digital services because mm. that is the way it's moved. The problem is that in many cases, some of the payments, some of the schemes are only accessible online. For example, uh, back to school clothing and footwear allowance in the summer mm. is primarily only online but you can request a paper version. So there really, there is always a backup option of a paper version. It's not always easy to get your hands on them, but there is an option. So we talk about medical care later on. Yeah, paper version form, online application. We talk about disability allowance invalidity, uh, uh, paper versions. Um, a lot of things like job seekers is now online. Illness benefit, you probably, you find that your doctor submits the stuff directly to the department. Mm. You can do it online or in paper version. So in many cases, it's pushing a lot of payments online. And I suppose if you think about it, that started since COVID when yeah, we had all yeah. the, the, the PUP payments mm. and everything online. So the, the mywelfare.ie is the portal for people to access a lot of online payments and make applications. To be fair, it is a more efficient process and uh, payments will be approved quicker. But that's not to say it should be the only option. Yeah. And and one of my bugbearers is that sometimes you're pushed yes. into digitization rather than going guided or asked to. Yeah. Um, so I suppose for people out there, um, if you come across a barrier where it, you're being pushed into that avenue, there should always be an alternative paper-based option and you can ask the department for a paper-based option. Uh, and we've seen that with revenue now. Mm. You do your tax returns generally online or claiming your taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, there isn't really a paper version for that one anymore. It's a lot of the, the med ones have moved. Uh, but for the things we've discussed today, Applications for housing, paper version, paper based version, yeah, yeah. treatment abroad, generally paper based versions and online applications. Okay. But for your listeners, please do not be frightened off by either being channeled down a certain direction. You could help is available to guide you down that way. But if you need help with a paper based version, feel free to get one and look for help filling it out. Mm. Uh, it is a barrier, in my opinion, and it's a barrier that needs to be overcome but people shouldn't be 
shuttles down an, an avenue that they don't feel comfortable with or confident yeah. with. Okay, thank you. So finally, um, last question. Um, what are your top tips for navigating the system, just in summary? In summary, the top tips, Grania, it is, in essence, knowing your rights. It's about not panicking. It's about asking for help. And the biggest difficulty I find with people is they're afraid to ask for help, right? And if you can overcome that barrier, that's the first step. Everybody's situation is different. Don't assume you're not entitled to anything. If you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't apply, you don't get. But there are tons and tons, and we haven't even touched on half of the stuff today, of the supports that are available. And even if you don't fit into any of those boxes that they want you to fit in, there's also options for what we call it uh, additional support, supplementary payments, one-off payments. We haven't even talked about today. Mm -hmm. So there can be scenarios in a one-off situation where you need financial help with something that occurred that you didn't plan for. So wherever you turn, there nearly is always help. Um, but you need to explore the options. You need to ask for help from an expert who knows how to guide you and put you in the right direction. And don't give up. Make an application. It doesn't cost you anything other than a stamp and your time. Okay. And on that note, we'll finish. Thanks, Thank Ronnie. you so much, Andrew McCann, today for all of that, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ron. That's all from this episode of Inflammation Nation. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or as they always say, wherever you get your podcasts. For further information about arthritis, you can visit our website, arthritisireland.ie, or contact our helpline on 0818 252 846. See you next time. Inflammation Nation is supported by Pfizer.